Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for Illinois Bone and Joint Institute's 33rd Virtual YMCA Education Series Program with the North Suburban YMCA. My name is Karen Brownlee, and I'm a personal trainer and the adult program coordinator at the NSYMCA in Northbrook, Illinois. We are recording this evening's presentation so that you will be able to revisit it again. Please feel free to tell your family and friends about it so that they too can view it on either the IBJI or NSYMCA websites. Entitled Common Hand, Wrist, Shoulder and Elbow Injuries, Dr. Leon Benson's presentation tonight will address problems in these upper extremities, which are becoming increasingly common in our population and can be the result of injury, disease, or repetitive motion. He will also discuss prevention, causes, diagnosis, and treatment options available because without appropriate treatment, a mild disorder of the upper extremity can lead to functional impairment, chronic pain, and occasionally deformities. Dr. Leon S. Benson began his medical career in Evanston, Illinois, the town where he was born and raised. After graduating as valedictorian of his high school class, he continued as a chemistry major at Northwestern University. In 1981, he started medical school at Northwestern University in downtown Chicago and completed a five-year residency in orthopedic surgery at Northwestern before pursuing an extra year of specialty training in hand and upper extremity surgery at Harvard. Dr. Benson returned from Boston in 1991 and has practiced with the same orthopedic group ever since. Dr. Benson is currently chief of the Division of Hand Surgery at North Shore University Health System, which is a four hospital health system in the Northern Chicago suburbs and includes a physician staff of over 2,400 doctors. North Shore also serves as the Northern Te Teaching Campus for the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. Dr. Benson holds an appointment as senior attending within the North Shore system and is currently president of the North Shore professional staff. He has additionally been active in clinical research relating to hand surgery. His scholarly production includes more than 20 articles in peer reviewed journals, a single authored text on teaching orthopedics, 10 book chapters and more than 40 scientific presentations to national audiences. Dr. Benson also serves as an associate editor for the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, the American volume, and writes a regular column for a national hand surgery newsletter. Plus, Dr. Benson does academic consulting work for the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery by writing questions for the National Certifying Examination in Orthopedic Surgery, as well as for the Certifying Examination in Hand Surgery. He currently holds the rank of Professor of Clinical Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. Dr. Benson, as you can see, spends much of his free time training his Portuguese water dog, Cruz. Say hi to Cruz, everybody. In addition to training his owner, Cruz participates in the sports of dog agility, obedience, water work, lure coursing, and also works in the clinical setting as a certified therapy dog. According to Dr. Benson, his philosophy of care is that technical expertise is just part of my job. He says, I believe in building relationships which means understanding patient concerns and creating an environment of mutual respect. To me, says Dr. Benson, serving as a physician is a privilege that involves not only managing disease processes, but also treating the whole patient, mind, body, and spirit. In addition, having a good sense of humor often makes the health journey a little bit easier, he says, and fortunately, that's a part of my personality. Fortunately for all of us, I'm sure we will get to experience his sense of humor tonight. During Dr. Benson's presentation this evening, you might find that you have questions, which he will be happy to address at the end of the program. Simply type your questions into the question section on your screen, and I will receive them and relay them to Dr. Benson immediately following his presentation. We will do our best to answer all the questions that you share, so feel free to ask multiple questions as they arise. I do ask that you please keep your questions general, as Dr. Benson will not be able to address individual concerns without individual consultation. If you do have self-specific questions, however, please contact Dr. Benson via one of the options that will be listed on the slide, which will be shown during the Q&A portion at the end of this presentation. One last thing before I turn the evening over to Dr. Benson, I invite you to mark your calendar for our next IBJI and NSYMCA Education Series program on Wednesday, October 26th at 7 p.m. Dr. Brian Clay will host I Don't Want Pills, I don't want surgery and I don't want pain. 
fo focusing on non-pharmacological and non-surgical pain management options for joint, spine, and nerve pain. Thank you again for joining us tonight. And thank you, Dr. Leon Benson, for your time and effort in putting together this program to take a look at common hand, wrist, shoulder, and elbow injuries, along with prevention, causes, diagnosis, and treatment options. Now, Dr. Benson and Cruz, please take it from here. Thank you. Am I uh, sharing my screen here or not yet? Not yet. It should be coming up. Okay. How's that? Can you see it now? Yeah, it's coming up. Yep. I see a background and your presentation. Okay. Perfect. There it is. Okay. So thank you, Karen, for that nice introduction that I'm sure my mother helped write. Um, tonight, the talk is going to be about common upper extremity injuries. Um, I'm going to give a whole bunch of information about common injuries in both adults and children, and then we'll have uh, hopefully some time afterwards for some questions and answers. So the two main groups of patients, the adults and of course pediatrics, which refers to people generally skeletally immature, meaning under the age of about 14 or 15. Why distinguished pediatric patients? It's because their healing biology is different and their mechanics of healing are different and their natural outcomes are different. So this usually accounts for why the same injury in a child and adult are often treated completely differently. Oops, that went too fast here. So, Healing biology, the time for a fracture in a child to heal is dramatically shorter than an adult. The mechanics are such that rigid fixation, meaning surgery with metal plates and screws, is not usually necessary. And children have a phenomenon called remodeling, which is a dynamic that allows for a good result despite significant initial angulation. So if you look at the x-rays that are on the screen here, on your left, you see a child with a broken arm where both bones are broken. And in one of the views, where it writes as portable there, you'll see it looks like his arm is really bent. And then the middle x-ray shows his child in the cast after a period of time. And then the last x-ray, the one on your right, shows that about three or four months later, the child's arm is straight. And that was done with nothing more than a cast because the child has the initial inherent ability to straighten a broken arm. So this type of fracture in an adult would require surgery, but in a child like this, you can really just immobilize them and their body sort of knows how to straighten it by themselves. This is actually thought to probably be due to the body's ability to detect the gravitational field. So there's actually an interesting question as to whether if this person were in outer space and like the space station where there's no gravity, whether this actually would happen, whether the arm would straighten by itself. But here on Earth, it happens reliably. And consequently, surgery for a fracture like this in children is not necessary. So very common, the most common part of the body in children, or second most common other than the clavicle, is the elbow. So elbow fractures are incredibly common. And um, this is true for both adults and children. And there's sort of uh, five main categories, the distal humerus, which means the end of the humerus near the elbow, the olecranon, which is a little pointy bone at the end of your elbow, and then the radial head and radial neck. And we'll sort of go through these briefly so you get a better understanding. And then you have fractures of the forearm, which are both bones, the radial ulnar shaft. And then there's two Italian names after that called Montasia and Galeazzi, which are variations of radial and ulnar shaft fractures. So let's look at distal humerus fractures first. These are really common in children. These are pediatric injuries where they usually fall off the monkey bars. In fact, monkey bars are suspect as being something orthopedic surgeons invented because they're so commonly the source of injury in children. This is one of the most common fractures in kids. It often needs surgical care because when the bone is broken and bent, in this particular case, you have to straighten it out in order for the arm not to heal in a crooked fashion. This is one of those injuries that does remodel, but it doesn't usually remodel enough that the children tolerate it as well as if they had had surgery. Surgery for this injury has changed as of 1985 approximately, it became obvious that pinning the elbow in an operating room was significantly better than leaving these kids alone, letting them heal as they sort of may. Uh, you can actually see in this photograph, the child with one of these injuries, it looks like the front of the elbow is really swollen, and this is because the end of the humerus is broken, and it causes this deformity. So the mechanism of injury here is usually a child falling on an outstretched arm. You'll see here it's sort of a monkey bar type of injury. The elbow's hyperextended. And this injury happens usually because this part of the elbow is a little bit underdeveloped in children and the bone in this area is incredibly thin. So when kids fall with their arm outstretched, it's very common that this is the thing that breaks. 
the end of the humerus fracture that we're talking about is sometimes called a supracondylar fracture because the condyles of the humerus are the bone at the elbow and it's broken across and just above the condyle, so it's called a supracondylar injury. These are photographs and diagrams of how the injuries occur. You'll see in class A, there's just a little crack there. In type B, the bone is extended a little bit. In type C, it's completely separated. Usually the type Cs are the ones that are unfortunately the most common, and those are the ones where the bone is completely broken off. And usually some sort of surgical intervention is required. For the less severe ones where there's just a little crack or the bone is bent a tiny bit, oftentimes you can treat those without surgery. These are um, x-rays of the type one, two, and three injuries. And you can see in the A x-ray, I gotta move this over so I can see what I'm looking at here. There you go, in the A film, you can see that there's just a little crack. In the B, there's an, a little deformity. And then in C, it's, you can see that the end of the humerus is broken off completely. And again, that's the type that would require an operation. All right, so let's see if I can, there we go, okay. Now the same fracture in adults can exist, but this fracture is a little bit different. This usually occurs from something like a car accident. It's rare that these occur when an adult falls on their arm. This usually exits into the joint space. So you can see in the ones labeled type B and C, the fracture line extends into the elbow joint. Usually you have to do a CT scan in adults to figure out exactly what the fracture consists of because it's hard to tell from a plain x-ray. And most of the time, these need surgery because they don't have the luxury of healing on their own very reliably. And in order to prevent arthritis from developing, typically you have to operate on these patients in order to line up the elbow joint again. So aligning up the joint is really the most important thing in getting the elbow to be able to move. This is true in adults and children. Um, in adults, if you can't really fix these because they're too smashed, as shown in this CT 3D reconstruction, sometimes you actually have to do an elbow replacement as a better option because the bone is broken too badly. Elbow replacements were started in the orthopedic horizon around 1980, and they've undergone multiple generations of improvements. So nowadays, an elbow replacement actually is a pretty reliable option. And it's not just done for people who have elbow arthritis, but for fracture situations where the fracture can't be easily reconstructed. Elbow replacement is easier to do and works better in the long run. So you'll see actually in these films, the films at the bottom are actually x-rays of the elbow CT you're seeing at the top right. And then you can see in the bottom right radiographs, you can see the x-rays show that an elbow replacement was done. And despite looking a little strange, this is no different than having a hip or knee replacement and the elbow moves well heals pretty reliably and the patients have great function and no pain. So this is a good solution when you can't put all the pieces of Humpty Dumpty back together again. So operating on distal humerus fractures or elbow fractures in adults as opposed to children is requires more than just a couple of pins. You usually have to use plates and screws. This surgery is pretty complicated. You have to sort of open up the elbow and cut through some bone in order to get it exposed. You have to find the ulnar nerve and move it out of the way and you have to put in a bunch of hardware in order to stabilize it. So the x-rays you're seeing here are typical x-rays in someone who had a bad humerus fracture at the elbow joint in an adult and then needed it reconstructed. Now, despite having all this uh, junkyard of hardware here, this actually works pretty well and is a good solution for people who have these fractures. And again, remember in children, their healing is so reliable, you don't need any of this stuff. Even in the children cases that are broken, that needs surgery, you can just fix it with a couple of smooth pins that are in for only three weeks and that's it. In the adults, it's a much bigger deal. The next classic fracture is something called the olecranon. The olecranon is the end of the ulna at the point of your elbow. So if you bend your elbow all the way up like this and then put your elbow down on the tabletop, that bone you're feeling is the tip of the ulna, which is called the olecranon. In children, this is a pretty unusual injury. Usually it doesn't uh, break in a way that needs surgery. Very often in children, these are like little buckle fractures. You can see that the arrow is showing a child's elbow where there's an olecranon fracture and you can sort of just barely see it. Now in adults, these are incredibly common and it's because the bone in adults, again, is a little bit different. It's not as rubbery, it's not um, easily tolerate trauma. It's more brittle. And so when people in adulthood fall on their elbow point, they break off the electron, and you can see in the x-ray there, there's a big chunk of bone that's broken off and separated. Now, this almost always needs surgery because without restoring that piece of bone, the elbow joint is disrupted, so the patients may develop elbow arthritis. 
The other thing is that the triceps muscle attaches to this piece of bone. So if you imagine you're gonna raise your hand or get out of a chair by extending your elbow, this piece of bone that's broken off would move instead of your elbow straightening. So you wanna restore this fracture back to where it belongs in order to give the patient's elbow extension strength. And that's one particular thing that's helpful, for example, that when you get out of a chair, you put your hands on the arm of the chair to get up. That's the thing that you're using is your triceps and your elbow extension. And if your electron is broken, it's hard to do that. So these fractures are very common. This is the kind of thing where you slip and fall in the parking lot outside a restaurant and um, fall on your elbow, this bone breaks. And then typically it requires an operation. Surgery to fix this uh, is pretty reliable. It takes about 45 minutes and it's not a dire emergency. Um, usually patients will come in a day or two after the injury and then have surgery scheduled sometime in the next week to get it over with. But this surgery actually makes elbow function really good. Um, there's a lot of ways to fix the elbow broken bone. You can see in these films, there's a bunch of different things. The x-ray on the bottom left shows the bone that's broken. And then in the middle, you'll see a plate and screws used to fit it, put it back together. And on the right, it's a little fancier technology that was developed in the last five to 10 years, which is sort of a wire and screw construct that works to put the electron back together. The fixation on the right is a little nicer because it's a little less prominent and lower profile. So when the surgery is over and the bone is healed, most patients don't need or notice the hardware and don't need to have it removed down the road. Some patients who've had the plate will choose to take it out at some point in the future because they can sort of feel it after the bones heal and their elbows recover. They don't like the feeling the plate under their skin. So the hardware on the far right in the uh, box labeled A is the one that's a little bit lower profile and fancier. Another bone that breaks around the elbow is called the radial head. Um, radial head fractures in children probably don't really occur, but they have this thing that's weird called the nursemaid's elbow. And um, what happens is, as shown in this picture, the child is reluctant to go into the barber shop or the dentist or the doctor across the street. So the parent grabs their arm and says, let's go, Billy, and yanks on their arm. And in a child under the age of three or four, sometimes the radial head will slide out of the socket slightly. And so this has been traditionally and historically called a nursemaid's elbow. I guess back in the day, the nursemaid yanked on the arm or was blamed for it. Um, and what happens is the radial head in the developing elbow has got some sort of laxity around it. So it sort of slides out of the socket very slightly. And this almost always comes from the child either getting into an awkward position where their arm gets yanked in extension. And you don't really need to have an adult villain yank on their arm. Some kids will have this injury occur just by falling on their elbow. This does not need surgery. A lot of times the kids will show up with, not, with pain in their arm and they won't use it. And this is something that I can re easily fix in the office without any kind of anesthetic or anything invasive. But um, you sort of have to know what you're doing. And it takes about 30 seconds to correct this. And you need to have sort of a good set of earplugs because the kids will scream a little bit. Um, but it, as soon as their elbow pops back in place, they feel better and ignore it and they run around and act normal. So giving them local anesthetic or putting them to sleep is completely unnecessary and out of proportion to what you need to do. The only reason I bring this injury up is because it's so incredibly common. Every young person um, in my extended family has had one of these and shown up in my office at one point or another when they were three or four with their arm swollen, unable to use it after some sort of incident, I was able to sort of snap these back in place. But the reason I put this up here is because if you look up a nursemaid's elbow, this is like a classic historical orthopedic thing. So the problem with this injury is that you'll see again, there's a diagram of a kid being sort of yanked on their arm. You can't really see anything abnormal on the x-ray. A child who's got one of these will hold their arm in extension and pronation, meaning they'll have their arm down by their side and they'll hold the palm of their hand facing their back. And then you can actually fix this problem by turning their arm with their palm up and then flexing their elbow. And you can actually feel the radial head sort of pop back in place. A lot of emergency rooms will try to do this, but they don't quite have the stomach to do it exactly the right way. <laughs> so a lot of times these kids will have somebody manipulate their elbow a few times before they show up in an orthopedic surgeon's office. But I've seen probably 500 of these in the last 30 years and they're pretty easy to fix. Now radial head injuries in adults are a different deal. You'll see the radial head is this round bone at the elbow. And when that breaks in an adult, that actually breaks in a lot of pieces. So again, the kids have these rubbery, plasticky kind of bones that are resilient and easily heal and they bend a little bit and they don't usually break. Adult bones, as you get past orthopedic 
maturity, your bones become more brittle, not in a bad way, but they become a little bit more por like porcelain instead of like rubbery or plastic. So when adults fall on their elbows, common they also can break the radial head. The radial head is this disc-like thing shown in these pictures. A lot of times, again, you can't quite tell how bad it is without getting additional imaging in addition to plain x-rays. So we frequently get a CT scan. There's a guy named Mason who classified radial head fractures and all you need to know basically is A is good, B is medium bad, and C is really bad. Like all classifications, A is good and C is bad. And the class C ones are broken in a million pieces. And in those cases, sometimes these pieces have to be removed in order to allow the elbow to move because they get turned upside down or get stuck in the way. In the type B injury, sometimes it's worth putting a pin or a screw in it to hold the little piece in place. In the type A injuries where there's such a crack, you don't have to do anything. They heal on their own. Sort of paradoxical, but I just did one of a really bad one yesterday, which was a type C radial head fracture. We had to replace the radial head with an artificial metal one because the radial head that was normally in the patient had broken too badly to be salvageable. So treating these where you can actually put little bone screws in them and put them all together, it sounds like a great idea, but it's really rare. Most of these injuries are either a type A where they don't need any surgery or a type C where you have to remove the whole thing and take the radial head out. So the idea that you can put a little plate in there and fix the radial head looks nice on a diagram. But these are really rare where you have a fracture that's bad enough to need surgery, but it's not so bad that you don't have to remove the whole thing because most of the time when they're broken, they're so broken badly, they're smashed in a thousand pieces. This x-ray at the bottom that just came into view is what it looks like when you do a radial head replacement. As I said, I just did it, you know, coincidentally, one of these yesterday. It looks exactly like this where a little metal implant is put in that restores the shape of the radial head with a little metal disc. So the elbow has stability and can move. And you read, the reason you do this is because the radial head that was broken is literally in a thousand pieces and it's impossible to salvage or put back together with plates and screws. And the last issue you have about elbows is uh, elbow fracture dislocations. And um, these are problematic because the elbow joint is nobody's friend when it keeps falling out of the socket. So in this x-ray, you can see an elbow joint that's sort of falling out of place where the humerus and the ulna are dislocating. And this usually happens because multiple things are torn. And in order to have this happen where it's really bad, you have three things torn, which is why orthopedically it was called the terrible triad. <laughs> Orthopedic surgeons are basically simplistic in their naming. So this usually means the radial head is broken, as well as a bunch of ligaments that are torn, and then the elbow is chronically unstable. And this is a bad deal. This has to be operated on. And you can see here, their arrow red arrow is pointing to a radial head fracture. And then there's another red arrow pointing to another part of the elbow broken called the coronoid. And this is sort of a mechanical or a, a cartoon diagram of that, we see the radial head's broken, there's other pieces there in the elbow joint, the humerus and the ulna are completely out of alignment, and this usually needs to be operated on. So again, that arrow's pointing to the radial head fracture, and these arrows are pointing to a broken coronoid, which is the lip of the ulna. So it's really sort of like saying that the socket of the elbow is broken badly enough that the humerus is no longer contained, and you have to do something to restore this. So you have to pretty much put the elbow back together, you have to repair ligaments, you have to replace the radial head. Sometimes you have to put in additional hardware to stabilize part of the ulna. And then you have to watch these people carefully. They need to be braced for a few weeks after the surgery in order for their soft tissues to heal. These are difficult injuries, but again, they're very common in adults where the elbow is susceptible to having multiple things break. And it really boils down to how hard did you fall on it? So somebody having a terrible triad injury where everything's broken and torn apart usually is not just a slip and fall in the kitchen. It's usually more like a motor vehicle accident or a mountain biking accident or skiing injury or something that's got higher energy associated with it. Again, you can see that red arrow or those little metal things. Those, those are pointing to metal anchors in the bone that um, indicate a ligament repair was accomplished. So those are anchors used to repair the lateral ligaments of the elbow. And the, this red arrow is pointing to more little bone screws and that's pointing to the radial head that was used to replace. And this is again showing a lateral x-ray of the elbow where you can see little anchors in place indicating a uh, ligament repair was done. You can see more bone anchors right there. Now, the red arrow. You never want to have an x-ray of your elbow where someone's showing you a lot of red arrows. And this is a, um, another uh, view showing the radial head replacement. Now we can move on to forearm injuries. And again, that first x-ray I showed you where the kid was remodeling was a, called a both bone injury. This is, again, <laughs> you understand the orthopedic surgeons are very simplistic. So the arm has two bones in it, 
between the elbow and the wrist. One's the radius and the ulna. So I always thought this was sort of bizarre when I said in my training, but when you break both of them, it was called a both bone fracture. It seems sort of idiotic to me, but that is traditionally what it's called. Ironically, if you ask any orthopedic surgeon what a both bone fracture is, they always know it means that it's the radius and the ulna. Now, a both bone radius and ulna fracture in a child under the age of eight usually can be treated with a cast or something because they were modeled so darn well that it doesn't often matter what their alignment looks like when they start because by the time they're done healing in three to six months, they'll start to straighten already. So most of the time under the age of eight, you don't have to operate on these kids, no matter what they look like, even though the parents will go crazy and look at the x-rays and show it to their friends and their mother-in-law and everybody's giving you opinions about how bad the arm looks. The fact of the matter is you don't really need to operate on these kids because the surgery is unnecessary. Now, if you look at kids who are a little bit older, between the ages of about nine and 13, they do remodel, but they don't remodel as vigorously as like a five-year-old. So sometimes they're in the radius and the almost broken badly. You're sort of in this in-betweener zone where they're sort of not quite adult-like, but they're not exactly as wonderfully plastic as little kids. So sometimes what you can do is straighten these out. In this case, you're seeing the arm of approximately a 13, a 12-year-old, and their arm is sort of jacked up. It looks a little crooked on the first set of films on the left. And then you can see on the right, the bones look a lot better because we put down these little metal flexible nails. And it's a little bit nicer and less invasive than having to put plates and screws on the bone. And it works super good because it's sort of a proportional in treatment. It's relatively small incisions. And you just have to snake these rods down the bone and we'll straighten them out. And it's a little bit nicer to do that than have to try to convince the parents the arm will be straight eventually. Because in a child who's a little bit older, the remodeling can take several years and sometimes it's not all the way complete. And so in this middle age range, in the sort of preteen age zone, when you have a bad arm fracture that's crooked, a lot of times using these flexible metal nails is a nice uh, solution. Now, once you get to be an adult, and orthopedically, you don't have to be 18 to be an adult. For girls, it's probably the age of about 14, and for boys, about 16 or 17. When you break your radius and ulnar shaft in adulthood, you got to fix these because these don't remodel. And the other thing is they don't heal very well because the bone's healing timeline is so long that they just sort of get into suspended animation, and these don't heal reliably. And so trying to treat these with a cast or a splint is sort of useless. And it's been pretty clear in the orthopedic literature since like the 1960s that nobody's happy treating these injuries without surgery. So these forearm fractures in adults, and again, that means over the age of about 14 years in a girl and maybe 16 years in a boy, you're better off treating these surgically. And the other thing is that putting in a metal rod in the middle of the bone down the bone like a straw doesn't work very well. You have to use plates and screws. So you're looking at treating this with what's called open reduction internal fixation, that's O-R-I-F, another orthopedic eponym. But you'll see in the x-ray shown here, the radius and the ulna have both metal plates on them. Looks sort of barbaric, I suppose, but it's orthopedically, it's a wonderful thing because these metal plates are designed for this fracture. They hold the bone in place. You can compress the fracture so it's not only lined up perfectly like a jigsaw puzzle piece, but it's sort of squished together so there's a little bit of compression on it. And the outcome of this is unbelievably good um, for a fracture that normally would be torture and would take forever to heal. So this is sort of the general approach to a radius and ulnar shaft fracture. That means broken in the middle of the form in adults. So in adults, this is a good thing. And um, there used to be sort of a focus on removing the hardware, but it turns out leaving these plates in place doesn't cause usually any problems. So almost always, I don't recommend removing the hardware unless it causes a problem, which is pretty darn rare. Some people want it out because they're anxious about it. Sometimes people can feel, believe it or not, the weather changing slightly uh, if they have metal plates in their arm and occasionally they get obsessed with that or it bothers them. But I'd say 95% of the time, you don't have to remove this hardware. It's stainless steel. It doesn't cause any allergic reactions or any problems down the road. So most of the time, I don't recommend the hardware being taken out unless you have good reason. Now, this is where we get into a couple of different names. What happens when you just break one bone of the arm and it's not the both bone fracture? Well, if you just break the ulna, it's called a montasia fracture. And the problem with this is that you can't just break one bone without disturbing the other. But when you break one in the middle and the other bone doesn't look like it's broken, it usually means part of it's dislocated. So when you look at this x-ray, you'll see in this child, the mid shaft of the ulna is broken. That's the part that looks bent and wacky. 
But you'll see the radial, the radius is actually dislocated from the elbow joint. And um, this is easy to miss because sometimes people get all focused on the ulna fraction. You know, remember that the radial head is dislocated. This is a classic, of all classic injuries. It's again, child falling from some height and in the process of hitting the ground, they sort of twist their arm in an effort to reduce the fall. And it sort of adds rotation to the injury. And instead of snapping in half, the arm sort of twists and one bone breaks and the other dislocates. Uh, and this is a classic injury. And it, again, in children, this sometimes needs to be pinned in some manner, but a lot of times you can straighten this out and treat it in a cast because based on the age of the child, it will heal quickly and it will remodel if it's a tiny bit crooked. Uh, you can see in this x-ray, the radius is reduced. You see in the previous one, it looks like the radius, which is by the elbow, is sticking way in front of the end of the humerus. So that's out. And this x-ray shows that the radius is in place. So that shows you how the radius should be parallel to the ulna. And Here's another x-ray where it shows the radius is in front of the end of the humerus, which is out. You want to not forget that. Now, in adults, if this happens, again, because of their brittleness of the bone and the slow healing, you got to put a plate on the ulna in order to straighten this out. So an adult, a montasia fracture where you break the ulna and the radial head dislocates, you almost always, like a both bone fracture, you have to put a metal plate on this. And uh, it's not really a bad thing. It's a great thing because the hardware that fixes this is so incredibly reliable, it's an excellent outcome, but you can't be fooled by the experience in children of trying to treat an adult without the surgery for this because it really doesn't work. And then you have the other injury that has an Italian name called a Galeazzi fracture, okay? So you have the Montasia where the ulna is broken and uh, Mon a Galeazzi fracture is when the radius shaft is broken and the ulna dislocates. And when the ulna dislocates, it dislocates at the wrist, and so Galeazzi was a radius shaft fracture and a dislocation of the ulna at the wrist. So these Montasia Galeazzi injuries are injuries of the forearm, but only one of the two bones is broken and the other one dislocates. And again, the same principles apply here. For most children under the age of nine, you can usually treat these with a cast. And for kids older than the age of nine, you usually need a pin. And if you have an adult, you probably have to plate these because the Galeazzi fracture in adult will not heal by itself. So again, you can see here, the arrow is pointing to the radius shaft that's broken, and that circle shows the wrist where the ulna is dislocated. And as I pointed out, um, usually you have to plate the radius in order to get it back out to length, because in adults, it will not heal in a timely fashion. It won't straighten if it's a little crooked. So if you want to get a good result in adult, you have to operate on this. And that's what the surgery looks like. Somebody put a metal plate, to hold the radius out to length and fix it. And then for some reason, they pin the ulna to the radius. Every once in a while, the ulna is a little wobbly because it dislocated. Some people choose to pin the ulna to the radius. Most of the time, you don't need to do that. It's just plating the radius and everything else falls into place and takes care of itself. You can see those are the pins for the ulna to the radius, which I don't think you need most of the time. So the last year I'm going to talk about are shoulder injuries. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about this. We're going to go through a couple of types of shoulder injuries, fractures, dislocations, something called internal derangement, and then soft tissue overload, which is probably the most confusing area of shoulder injuries. And again, these tend to be higher energy injuries. So unfortunately, you break your shoulder, you usually have to fall down in some sort of awkward way. And it doesn't necessarily have to be off a ladder when you're working for ComEd, like in this case. But um, yeah, these injuries also do occur in slip, slip, slippery floors at home or at work. So fractures of the shoulder usually come from falling or blunt trauma. Ladders, scaffolding, tools, equipment falling, stairs, power cords, lifting unsafe or unsecured loads. It's all the reasons why people tend to fall, especially at work, and have some accident that busts up their shoulder. Many of the fractures that occur in the work, you know, from high energy benefit from surgery. So when you break your arm and the humerus, which is the ball and socket of your shoulder, is broken in a bunch of pieces, usually surgery helps. These are high energy injuries, especially if you fall off a ladder. Usually the recovery is about six to 12 weeks. And usually people can go back and function pretty normally after the fact. Although again, these are higher energy injuries and take longer to recover from. You can see in this x-ray, this person has what's called a four-part fracture because the humerus, which normally should look like a round ball, 
looks like sort of a smashed ball because there's four separate pieces, the greater tuberosity, the lesser tuberosity, the neck of the humerus and the head. It's all sort of broken apart. In these cases, putting it back together is probably better, especially if the person is normally functional. So certainly involves putting these things back together. These are more complicated and lengthier surgeries and operating on the arm or the elbow. Um, you can see in this case, there's a metal plate holding the humerus back together and it looks more like a ball and socket now. Uh, not all of these need surgery, but even the ones that don't and can have the potential to heal on their own, the recovery time is still pretty significant, about six to 12 weeks. And usually the patients benefit a lot from doing physical therapy after the fact because the tendency is not to move, especially when something hurts. And if you don't move it, eventually you get incredibly stiff. So you need a therapist, which is sort of like your shoulder coach, to coach you along and get you to help you to move, even though it's a little bit sore, so you don't get too stiff and you can recover faster. Now, dislocations means that the ball and socket is out. And so you can see in the x-ray in this film, the ball of the humerus on the far right film is like knocked out of the socket. So it looks like there's a socket with nothing there and the humerus is below it. And then in the film, just to the left of that, you can see the socket and ball are back lined up again. This is usually some sort of awkward fall. And a lot of times people will fall by accident with their hand behind their back or overhead. And um, yeah, you know, I can blame the victim here saying it's unsafe behavior, but a lot of times this will be falling in a situation where a ladder isn't secured or somebody loses their balance. Um, if the ball and socket are out, you really have to sort of get these back in place as soon as you can. So a lot of times these people will present to the emergency room and then usually somebody at that time, either an emergency room professional or an orthopedic surgeon, will sedate them and try to sort of snap this back in place so that it's not dislocated for very long. Now, dislocations, as I pointed out, are better off put back in place pretty quickly. Most emergency rooms in the United States know how to do this. Usually it's a little bit of sedation, so the patients get a little bit drunk, so to speak, and they relax, and then you can sort of pull their arm and put it back in place. If for some reason they can't put it in place, they have to call an orthopedic surgeon. If they can't put it in place, you have to do this in the operating room. Yeah, the, what happens is if the patients repeatedly dislocate their shoulder, every time it comes out of the socket, it makes it more likely to happen again. So in the case of somebody who repeatedly dislocates their shoulder, has multiple injuries, um, a lot of times surgery has to be done in order to stabilize the ligaments that are torn. But most people, if they dislocate their shoulder once from some awkward accident and it gets back put in place, they don't need surgery to treat that if it's a one-time deal. Some people get confused about what's called a shoulder separation. This is not really a dislocation. It's the end of your clavicle gets injured and you can see in the bottom of this cartoon where it says grade three, it looks like a clavicle is sticking up over the end of the rest of the shoulder. And that's called a shoulder separation. It relates to tearing some of the ligaments around the clavicle, causing it to uh, come out of place. Most of these injuries, shoulder separations, occur from things like football or falling off your bicycle and landing on the point of your shoulder. Shoulder separations almost never need surgery. There's only rare situations where surgery is worthwhile or work uh, effective. Even if the clavicle heals slightly out of place and makes like a little bump at the top of your shoulder, most patients won't have symptoms and have normal shoulder function. So AC joint separations or shoulder separations usually can be treated symptomatically with a sling. And they, they can take a long time to get better, though. It still takes six to 12 weeks for the patients to feel better. So the third class of problem in the shoulder is called internal derangement. And again, orthopedic surgeon being sort of simplistic, this means something's wrong inside. Something is deranged inside. Oh, let's call that internal derangement. It basically means that there's like a ligament or cartilage tear inside the shoulder. And the cartilage inside the shoulder is called the labrum. Some people have heard the name meniscus. That's the name of the cartilage inside your knee. Inside the shoulder is called the labrum. You can have a ligament tear. You can have a little piece of loose cartilage floating around like a peanut shell. It's loose inside a machine and causing problems. You can have a growth inside the shoulder, like a little ganglion cyst. These are all problems that are sometimes referred to as internal derangement. It's not a dislocation. It's not a broken bone. It's something that's torn inside the shoulder joint, the soft tissue. So the classic problem is that somebody tears something inside the shoulder, and it makes the shoulder slide around and hurt. It can actually predispose to the shoulder sliding out of the socket, which is shown in the picture on the far right bottom. So once it's dislocated or has a torn labrum or ligament that have been stretched or damaged, it sometimes allows the shoulder to keep sliding out of the socket and that makes nobody happy. 
So that usually requires repairing the soft tissues, meaning the ligaments and the labrum. And almost always now in the last 25 years, this is done arthroscopically. When I was a medical student and resident, this meant you had to have a giant incision on the front of your shoulder to get inside the hood of the car and repair what's going on inside there. But now you can sneak in with an arthroscope and fix all these things without making big incisions. And it's a lot faster and it's less painful and it works better. And ironically, without opening everything up, you can see better because the technology of arthroscopy has gotten so advanced. It's like a little high definition camera where you can sneak inside the shoulder and look around and do stuff without having to open everything up. So if you tear the labrum or the ligaments from repeatedly falling on your shoulder or pitching too much for the White Sox, you wind up sometimes needing arthroscopy to repair the stuff inside the stretch or damage. And these are also very common shoulder problems where people will say, I don't know what's wrong because my shoulder x-rays look normal and nothing's broken. A lot of times you can see what's wrong by getting an MRI. And then if the patients continue to have symptoms despite doing physical therapy and taking some medication, a lot of times arthroscopy can repair what's torn. So shoulder instability is super common in baseball players. And you take a look at this picture, you know why? Because they put their arm in these ridiculous postures where they're hyperextending their arms so much. It's like, I don't know, 9,000 times a year. You know, a pitcher in the major leagues will throw like 90 to 100 pitches if he stays in the game. And it's unbelievable on a stress. For the average person, though, an internal derangement injury tearing the ligaments or labrum inside the shoulder can be caused by overhead activity, garage door repair person painting the ceiling, working overhead on a scaffold, or falling on your arm repeatedly can also tear stuff inside. So you don't have to be a professional athlete repeatedly twisting your arm in crazy positions. You can still tear things by just having an accident or doing too much. Now, last category we'll talk about in the shoulder is called soft tissue overload. And God forbid, this is bringing up the subject of the rotator cuff. And rotator cuff is a troublesome entity because it has a confusing name. To guarantee you no orthopedic surgeon named this because we would have called it a bunch of tendons or the fabulous four or something like that. But the rotator cuff is a weird name and it doesn't lend itself to anything intuitive. Like when you say rotator cuff, it's hard to imagine like what in the world are you talking about? From an anatomic standpoint, the rotator cuff is actually four separate tendons. The supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the subscapularis and teres minor. These are all Latin names for muscles that live around your shoulder joint. And the reason I suspect it was called the rotator cuff is because they all four tendons sort of blend together. You can see in this picture where the white stuff is, they all blend together and they form sort of like a little hood around the top of the humerus. So when you wanna raise your arm up overhead, and put it forward or move it repeatedly up and down like you're raising the sail on your boat, it is the rotator cuff muscles that help you do that. And if these muscles tear, it causes some pain and it causes some impairment in muscle function. And it's a pretty common problem to have actually as you get older because the warranty for the rotator cuff is only about 60,000 miles. So once you're over the age of 60, a lot of people have rotator cuff degeneration that is normal based on their age and it's a biology of aging. It doesn't mean that they fell off their ladder. But there's a lot of confusion about what ro rotator cuff tears mean and what has to be done for them. Not to mention the fact that the rotator cuff name doesn't even make a lot of sense at first blush unless you look at anatomy. Now the rotator cuff is at risk for injury because it slides. It slides on top of the humerus and underneath the clavicle. So if you get a little bit of arthritis by the clavicle, it's like having some stalactites in the roof of your room or your shoulder where your cuff lives. So this tendon, which is sliding underneath the clavicle, it starts to get abraded by these little arthrit arth arthritic bone spurs. And the humeral head below it sort of rides up and pushes a lot on the rotator cuff. So the rotator cuff is like the hardest working tendon in rock and roll and orthopedic surgery. It's always moving and it's getting sort of squished between the humerus and the clavicle. If you go a little bit of arthritis or age-related changes there, the rotator cuff starts to tear. And remember, it's like four things. So when someone says I have a rotator cuff tear, you really, that orthopedically doesn't convey a lot of information because you've got to know like, there's four things that in the rotator cuff, which of the fourth are all four things torn? Is just one thing torn? So that's where a little bit of the confusion arises. And the other problem is that the rotator cuff, remember, it like wears out. It's like looking at a tire tread on a car that has a lot of miles on it. Like you wouldn't look at a car that has 60,000 miles, never had a tire change and expect the tire tread to look perfect. It's gonna look worn. And you'd say, oh, it must be tire disease. Oh no, it has 60,000 miles. That's like normal for a car that has 60,000 miles. 
The other problem is in this particular area, the slightest bit of inflammation in this area will cause the rotator cuff to get more irritable and hurt. And it sort of degrades its image on MRI and makes it look like it's torn when in fact, you're looking at images that reflect inflammation. So if you're over than, older than 60 and you decided to paint the baby's room for one of your kids or something, and then your shoulder's sore and then someone gets an MRI, says you have a rotator cuff tear, you already figured out what day you want surgery. And in fact, you don't need surgery because this is a normal process of aging and then you did a little too much. So rotator cuff tears that are traumatic, they can be from blunt trauma or an unexpected motion. So someone throws a piano at you and you're trying to catch a piano falling down a ladder and you grab it and of course it almost rips your arm off and you can tear your rotator cuff doing that. But remember, rotator cuff wears out naturally with age and arthritis just above it at the end of the acromion or the AC joint can be a major factor. So while rotator cuff tears can occur from trauma, the most common scenario is that somebody has some rotator cuff damage already, and then they do something kooky or they have an injury and it tears a little more and then becomes more symptomatic. But what you're really seeing is an injury that's superimposed on somebody who already has 60,000 miles of tire wear. And so a lot of times there's more complexity to the fact that it's not just a perfectly normal rotator cuff and then it tears. The rotator cuff tendons are really thick it's like trying to grab a piece of pile carpet in your hands and tear it with your hands. It's like really, really hard to do. And so what you could do to tear that carpeting with your hands is of course the carpet is old and somebody's walked on it like 8 million times and it's worn, then it's easier to tear it because it's already got a lot of wear. So that usually is why people get rotator cuff tears. It's really hard to tear it when it's normal. And that's why you won't see rotator cuff tears too commonly in 25 year olds because their rotator cuff is healthy and thick and rubbery and it's hard to tear. So that's why it's hard to figure out what caused the rotator cuff injury. And in most people, when rotator cuff damage from a workplace injury exists, it's because they came to the sort of situation with some mileage on their shoulder to begin with. Rotator cuff injuries are very rare in patients under the age of 40, partly because their tissues are a little bit more strong and elastic. And this is not to blame people older than 40. I mean, holy cow, I'm older than 40, 41, of course. But the fact of the matter is that it's a normal process of biology that your tissues change a little bit as you age and it puts you at risk for having it easier to be damaged by some injury that normally wouldn't cause too much trouble if you were 40 years younger. So 75% of older patients will have actually rotator cuff tears and this is showing an MRI of one where you can see a little arrow pointing to it actually, but they don't feel anything. Because, you know, your body uh, accommodates to change really well when the change occurs slowly. And this is like wearing out a little tire tread. So a lot of patients my age will have rotator cuff damage they don't even know about because it's not symptomatic and it has occurred slowly over time. And that's one of the reasons why you always got to be careful about getting an MRI. Because when you get an MRI in somebody, you're looking at just a snapshot of their problem. You don't have any information about does it hurt them, do they have it before, did it just start? You're just getting like one photograph, basically, of what they were that day of the MRI. And the radiologists don't examine the patient, so they'll dictate all kinds of stuff that will cause you to have another problem called a heart attack. Because when you read the radiology report of your shoulder MRI, it'll have like a paragraph a mile long, and they'll sound like you're about to die of shoulder disease or something. And it's just the radiologist reading everything very face value and not assigning any relative importance to it. So you always gotta be really careful if you ever get an MRI of your shoulder, to make sure you go over with someone who can help you interpret what in the world it means. Because otherwise, when you read it by yourself, you'll really be calling like a rabbi or a chaplain after that because it'll sound like you're about to die. The fact of the matter is that these reports are not too helpful and you need to really examine the patient and get their history and find out how old they are and what they do and how long their shoulders have been hurting. And even actually also correlate the MRI with the plain x-rays in order to determine what exactly the MRI means. Because just getting it and taking that one giant chunk of information in isolation will make everybody upset and hysterical. And it's usually the MRI shows mostly things that are normal for age in terms of progression. It's just hard sometimes to interpret what's normal for me in my lifestyle and progression of my body without someone coaching you a little bit. And that's where your orthopedic surgeon will help you. So what about rotator cuff treatments? Well, let's say you have an acute tear of the rotator cuff and it was just torn because you got into a sword fight with someone and they actually cut your rotator cuff. Yeah, I mean, that can be repaired and you can repair that arthroscopically. It's an outpatient surgery. It's a wonderful thing. Recovery takes a while, three to six months. 
You don't need to be in some sort of crazy sling or not use your arm at all. There's a lot of rumors flying around about how bad the surgery is. It's gotten a lot better. It's not as painful. It works pretty well. But remember, the words rotator cuff tear and an MRI report don't mean you need surgery. And you'd have to have the right circumstance and imaging to justify doing an open or do, doing a, an acute repair of rotator cuff tears. Most rotator cuff tears don't cause any symptoms, and most of them recur because of the natural process of aging. Now, what about injury prevention to try to prevent rotator cuff tears? Well, these sounds all great, but you know, good luck doing all this, like avoiding falls. Like who doesn't know to try to avoid fall and avoid falling objects and understand how to use equipment properly and wear protective gear. And when in doubt, here's a good one. Get help. So, like when you try to change a light bulb or do anything in your house, this is a good uh, admonition for anything in orthopedics. Most people wind up getting hurt because they had a great idea and they got impatient and decided to stand on a swivel chair and change the light bulb and they fall off the swivel chair and break their neck or break their arm or break their shoulder or tear everything. So, um, prevention for these things is mostly trying to be patient when you're trying to accomplish any task and get help or get the right equipment like a proper ladder or step stool or get someone out. Here's an idea, hire someone else to do it and have them fall instead of not you. But I mean, I don't want to be too negative about it. But the fact of the matter is um, a lot of times I'm the same way. I get impatient. I want to do something. I'm going to change the light bulb. I got it in my pocket. I'm going to get up on I'm going to stand on my desk or stand on my dog's platform, which is unstable and only holds 40 pounds. So most of the time adhering to a safety culture means um, trying to be patient and do things in a way that is intentionally designed for you not to fall and get hurt. So these, <laughs> these are all um, little cartoons I found on the internet, which basically show you all the ways that people get hurt. And, you know, unfortunately in orthopedic surgery, like, yeah, we see this literally every day of the week, all year round for like 35 years. <laughs> so people do all kinds of things. And if you look at the one um, on the top right, yeah, I actually fell off a ladder <laughs> about, a month ago. Now it was only one step, okay? But uh, it, it was a little awkward. And the fact is, I was trying to rush through something. And then um, the one on the bottom row, second to the right, is that guy falling off the chair. Yeah, I've done that a few times. So, uh, and then what you have to be really careful for is that one on the far bottom right, where the guy is, I believe that is a um, cartoon showing someone slipping on an ice. He's a little snowflakes there. Uh, yeah, we're coming up to the winter in Chicago, and the ice thing is just absolutely brutal and people fall on the ice first thing in the morning when they go out to get the paper and let the dog out. So you don't realize the ground is frozen and they don't pay attention to it. So because of what I do for a living, every time I open the door in the winter, the first thing I do is like, I like biopsy the pavement. Like I try to determine if there's ice on it that I can't see because I don't want to be in one of those statistics where I break my wrist or dislocate my shoulder falling on the ice. And if you really look at some of the companies around here, this is the last thing I'll go through. This is an example of UPS down the road from us, but they actually collect data on injuries, especially shoulder stuff, and they have a more sophisticated approach. So they keep track um, of how their workers get injured. And if you ever see a UPS truck, and you see this thing in the red circle, that actually is a handle that was installed because when the drivers get on these trucks and get off of them, they, the company determined by looking at their data that the drivers were constantly injuring their shoulder because they're trying to pull themselves up into the truck and there's nothing to grab onto. And when they get out of that chair, which I think it looks ridiculously high, when they get out of this like chair, which is the driver in these UPS trucks, there's nothing they use to sort of stabilize themselves stepping down off the driver's seat and going out on the pavement. And so UPS, I don't know, about 10 years ago, decided to put these like safety handrails you'd see in the bathroom on all of the trucks just inside the front door. And that turns out it's it made their incidence of employee shoulder injuries go to like zero, which is sort of an amazing thing. Like however much that handrail cost, I guarantee it was more expensive to treat the employees who hurt their shoulders. So there actually is sometimes an analytic approach to trying to prevent these injuries from occurring. And sometimes you can be thoughtful about it. Now at home, the principle still holds, get help, use the right tool, use the right step ladder, or don't do it. Have some, you know, get, get one of your grandchildren or your brother-in-law or somebody else to do it. So, so you don't get hurt. So I don't know if I'm, what time do I, yo, look at that, 754. So that's all I'm gonna talk about tonight. Um, this is actually a picture of my two prior dogs. Unfortunately, both of these dogs have passed away. The one in the little orange hat was Chelsea. It was our girl, she lived until she was almost 16. And then Cooper passed away this past February. He was 12 and a half. But um, we were lucky to get 
one of Cooper's puppies, which is Cruz, who is now, I don't know if you can see this, he's fast asleep here. Cruz, come in. Come in, buddy. <laughs> oh, sorry. He doesn't like when I wake him up. Come here. Come here. Up, up, up. Come on. Oh, there you go. Good boy. So Cruz here is uh, Cooper's son, and he is 18 months old. And we were fortunate to get one of Cooper's offspring to stay with us after we lost our two dogs. These are all Portuguese water dogs. Um, and the good news is they don't shed. So we don't get hair in the butter dish from them. Um, and they're also very smart. They have a mind of their own, which makes it a little bit of a challenge to train. Anyway, so awesome. I think I'm going to stop there. There you can see a picture. That was Cooper and Cruz when he was a puppy. That was about a year ago. And that was that's a father's son photograph. And here's a picture of me and Cruz together about two months ago when we were at a sporting event together. And here he is, he was sleeping. So <laughs> anyway, so that's all I have. If people have questions, I'll let Karen sort of moderate the question session. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Benson. A lot of great information and you already answered uh, several of the questions that came in. So thank you for that. Um, someone asks, what topical product do you recommend for shoulder or wrist pain? Uh, topical products are a variable value, but if you're going to use one, I'd probably use topical anti-inflammatory, sometimes called Voltaren. The trade name or the generic name is Diclofenac. It used to be a prescription. It is no longer. And if you're looking for it, it almost always comes in an orange tube. So I think Walgreens and CVS has it. And what it is, it's like a topical version of Advil. And even if you can't tolerate uh, Advil or Aspen because your stomach gets upset, this stuff probably won't have that effect. And if you're going to put a topical thing on, that probably works best. There's other products out there. I, I think some of it is a little bit more marketing than efficacy. So I would probably recommend using topical Voltaren or Diclofenac ointment. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and this question, and I'm sorry, I don't know what PRP stands for, Plenty but someone plasma. asks what, I say it again? It's platelet-rich plasma. Got it. They wanna know your thoughts on platelet-rich plasma as it relates to a complete rotator cuff tear and or on arthritis in the wrists. Uh, you know, platelet-rich plasma sounds really good and it's been around for about 20 years. I, I personally don't think it works that well. I'd argue that it probably is effective about half the time. And what it is is that um, you have some blood drawn from you, like a blood draw, tube of blood, and then you uh, spin it in a centrifuge, which can be done on your average tabletop centrifuge, and it allows the blood components to separate. And you sort of siphon off the platelets. And it was from the principle that platelets have some sort of magical healing power, they probably do, but um, it was, it's was it been used more popularly in to treat inflammatory symptoms, so like tennis elbow or wrist arthritis or shoulder problems from chronic rotator cuff tears. I'm not totally convinced it works as well as it was thought to initially. People are always looking for the next best thing. Um, yeah. I think that most of the time those problems can be treated usually with a steroid injection, oral medication like Advil or Aleve, or possibly physical therapy. Um, I wouldn't be opposed to platelet-rich plasma as a, you know, option. It works in some situations, but I would say that its popularity has been, its enthusiasm from the surgical side of the treaters has diminished in the last 15 years because it's not quite as effective as it was initially thought when it first came out. It was very popular when it first came out because everybody's excited. It's a magic thing, but I'm not sure it's uh, quite magical. It works in some situations. It's not a dangerous thing to do. Uh, it's a little bit of a nuisance, but I mean, it's basically a blood drawn and someone gives you a shot of this stuff wherever you're hurt and you wait a month or two and see if it helps. Got it. Great. Thank you. All right. If a 70 year old has a rotator cuff tear, will continuing to play tennis worsen the tear? Uh, yeah, it might, but you know what worsens the tear even worse is just getting older. <laughs> <laughs> So if you figure out how to stop the aging process, you're going to win a lot of money and your shoulder will get better. But, you know, the thing is that as our body gets older and things start to wear out a little bit, the body is really, really good at adapting to change when it's not all of a sudden. 
So if you don't wake up one day and your rotator cuff literally just fell apart that morning, that never happens. It changes slowly over time. So a lot of times people get an MRI on their shoulder and it looks like the rotator cuff is torn and they get all bummed out about it. But the fact is that when you really talk to them and you examine them, they actually have pretty good shoulder function. And you're looking at it like, how in the world can that be? They can raise their arm, they can move it all around like a magician and the rotator cuff is torn. Well, it's because the body is very, very clever at figuring out ways to work around a mechanical problem that is occurring slowly. So a lot of times patients have absolutely great function of their shoulder with a rotator cuff that looks terrible on the MRI. You may talk to them and say, well, how much does it really hurt? I don't know, when I play tennis for two hours, it hurts. Well, I, I got news for you. My, I don't have a rotator cuff tear. My shoulder hurt after two hours of tennis too. I mean, you, you then realize that the patient's functionality is really good. They don't have that many symptoms and they can do the things that they love. So it turns out it's probably really more important to play tennis and enjoy yourself and get your sort of mind and body balance and your psychology of uh, uh, being rounded and enjoying life. That's a really important thing. And I would argue that playing tennis in of itself with a rotator cuff tear, if you're able to do it without too much pain, yeah, you're not really making things worse. You don't have to feel guilty about that. Actually, you're lucky. You're like magically blessed because your body has accommodated to this problem that occurs from the natural process of aging and you're still able to do all this stuff. So I, I would encourage patients to stay as active as they can and only consider intervention when you really can't function in something you love to do anymore. And if you can function, whether it's gardening or tennis or water skiing or pickleball, whatever you like to do, and you're not having much pain, you can do it. No, you don't feel guilty about that. You keep doing it. because. Um, one thing you want to do, if you can, is stay away from doctors. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. So Thank I, you. I would say it comes up a lot. People worry that I, I know I have this problem, but I feel guilty because I'm playing tennis all the time. Yeah, yeah, don't feel guilty about that. When it gets to the point where you have enough pain, you can't sleep or you can't play tennis or it hurts to get a cup of coffee. Yeah, by all means, go see an orthopedic surgeon and get that straightened out. But... Um, you know, I, I'm going to have an operation to make my MRI look better, but I'll have to give up tennis. Yeah, that's like, doesn't make any sense at all. Great. That's super helpful. Thank you very much. All right. Um, you, you had talked about the Voltaren for an external pain reducer. Yeah. Yeah. Someone is asking, what about ibuprofen for shoulder pain? Yeah, um, can it uh, that, that class of drugs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, they're called NSAIDs non steroidal anti-inflammatories. That class of drugs, sort of like a wonder drug. Aspirin is in that class. Advil, Aleve, uh, Motrin is also the same as Advil. Those are non-prescription versions of it. Um, Aleve is actually naproxen, which used to be a prescription about 15 years ago. Those work super well. Um, you wanna make sure that you're not taking too much of it to cause stomach upset or to overload your kidneys, but to be honest with you, it's pretty hard to do that. Like you'd have to take gigantic quantities to have real complications from them. Um, all of those drugs, including Tylenol, could potentially affect your blood pressure a little bit. But again, I, I rarely see people with complications from those meds. Um, you would be surprised that a little bit of anti-inflammatory medication could go a long way. There are other variations of anti-inflammatory medication like that that are prescription strength. And then there are some in a separate class that are specifically designed not to cause stomach upset. So if you can get a good result from taking Advil or Motrin, but it upsets your stomach, there's another type of anti-inflammatory called Celebrex, which is sort of like a second generation anti-inflammatory and it works around your stomach so you don't have problems. But that entire class of medication is like the um, first line of defense against a lot of orthopedic problems. And I, you know, we put patients on that literally all the time. You don't have to be on it for life, but you'd be surprised if you take an anti-inflammatory for two or three weeks, how much better it'll make you feel. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and then I think I will go with our last question so we don't keep you too late or stray off the topics that you covered tonight. Um, do supplements work for joints? You know, the joint supplements, do those work to help people with joint pain? Uh, I mean, it, it depends on what you believe. You know, the supplement business in the United States and the world has been around for hundreds of years in one form or another, probably thousands uh, in the world. And um, there's varying science behind whether that stuff works or not. Um, I would say that in some cases it can be helpful. It's on a case by case basis. I would encourage people not to spend tons and tons of money on it if they're not clearly getting benefit from it. 
Uh, some of that science is still not sort of worked out completely. And the results of supplements in general are a little bit more like the dietary supplement business to lose weight. That is, it, there's sometimes fads will emerge that seem to be fueled by lots of enthusiasm. And you need to be careful about separating about who's enthusiastic, the users or the salespeople. <laughs> you know, but I, I wouldn't say that those things are necessarily dangerous. I just would normally counsel somebody that if you're really not sure it's helping you, don't don't spend tons of money on it because if it doesn't help pretty clearly, it's probably not going to help. Um, and the other thing is that probably the best advice I can give you is that see an orthopedic provider and actually get a better idea objectively about what's wrong and a lot of times it's simply being examined and maybe getting x-rays of the joint or the part of your body that hurts so you actually are treating it with something that makes sense so if you have a mechanical problem where you're driving on a flat tire the analogy being you have tremendous arthritis in a bone or a joint in your body and it's completely misshapen and you're like moving around a square wheel yeah i mean all the supplements in the world aren't going to help that because it's more of a mechanical thing if you have an episode where you have inflammation, but your x-rays fundamentally and your motion and function are pretty good, then treating it with medication or supplements may actually be the way to go. But that's an orthopedic surgeon can help you sort that out pretty quickly. Great, great. Thank you very much. And so for the people who had the other questions about very specific things like frozen shoulder and de Quervin's tendinosa vides and um, uh, other other challenges like like different types of arthritis in the shoulder. I will ask you to please reach out to Dr. Benson uh, individually because he didn't cover those topics tonight, and we want to make sure to give him an evening after you know after this great presentation tonight. So um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us tonight, and especially thank you, Dr. Benson, for your time and for introducing us to Cruz. Um, we really appreciate it. Come on up here. He's he, he's, he's so well behaved. He was just sleeping during my talk, which unfortunately, I hope that wasn't indicative of everybody else sleeping during my talk. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we all really enjoyed it. All, all right. right. Thank you again, Dr. Benson. Have a great night. Take care, everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.